Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and continue our discussion on basically the, the normal distribution, but we're going to open it up a little bit more, and we're going to talk about what's called uh, the central central limit theorem. Okay, so we're going to get into this by kind of doing a quick review of our normal distribution. Okay, so if we remember our normal distribution, we've got some sort of bell curve. And in the middle, we've got our mu. And coming out, we've got our standard deviation. And if we see it in shorthand, it would be something like this, n mu comma, and then this would be sigma squared, because in the shorthand we see it as variance. Okay, so we have some distribution, and what we have been talking about before is, let's take some critical value and find the probability, or the area under the curve of either to the left or to the right. And we've been taking like a single critical value. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this a, a step further. We're going to talk about, okay, so what happens if instead of just taking a single observation, if instead we talk about a sample size of like 10 or 20, where we take a lot of people and take their average, how is that distributed um, with respect to like the original distribution and kind of like what goes on? All right, so let's do a quick review back with our normal distribution, we knew that we could calculate out the z-score by simply doing the single observation minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation. That would tell us how many standard deviations away are we from the mean. Okay, now if we were to, let, let's make this an actual example. Let's go and instead of saying mu and sigma, let's put in some numbers. So let's do average male heights in the US. So we could put in something like here of, I think the average is 70 and the standard deviation is roughly six. Okay, and I could ask you like, what's the probability of randomly selecting one person who is like, I don't know, six foot four or 76? inches. What's the probability that they will be that tall or taller? And we could do something like that. Okay, so how, how crazy would it be to pick just one person who is six foot six? And you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, you know, a couple people who are six foot six or, or taller, or six, I guess this is six foot four, excuse me, six foot four or taller. And yeah, it's, it's possible. It's not a crazy thing to happen. Now, now my next question is, okay, what if we were to randomly select 10 or 20 people? Let, let's do 10. 10 people. And what would the probability be that all 10 of those people have an average height of 6 foot 4 or taller? So what that's saying is, let's go back to our distribution and let me, let me do just a little bit of erasing. We'll erase out this probability and we'll clear out this one just to clean it up a little bit. Okay, so if we took 10 people and we took their averages just with respect to the distribution, you know, some of them are probably gonna be a little bit low, some of them are probably gonna be a little bit tall, so I've got four, there's five. I might get like one person who's really tall and somebody else who's a little shorter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's do three more. We've got like one, two, and three. Okay, and when we look at these distributions, kind of their averages, you know, might be something like right there. Because we kind of got this outlier. It's dragging us up a little bit. Um, so maybe something like that. Now, my question is, is like what, how hard would it be to see something that looks like this, where we have, I'll do circles for this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then the average of those guys would be kind of at this point on our x axis. How likely is that going to happen? Well, we know the population is distributed normally about 70. So getting all 10 up really high is actually pretty unlikely. 
when we have a sample size of 10 or, or 20, we know that they're basically going to be clumped about the mean. So getting really high above or really far below the mean is pretty unlikely. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, okay, so the, the distribution of the sample mean is instead going to look something like this, where it is tighter and then it comes back down. So the big difference here is the means are the same, but the standard deviation changes when we talk about a sample size. Okay, so this guy is, so with respect to one observation. Okay, and then let's do another one with respect to, so with respect to sample size. Okay, we're still in a normal distribution. The only thing that happened is it got pinched down. So our z-score, we still are doing a z-score, equals, but instead of talking about x, which is a single observation, we're gonna talk about x bar, which is the average. We're gonna talk about the sample average. Then from there, we're going to subtract uh, the population mean still. Population mean doesn't change. Still going to subtract by 70 or in this one, or sorry, so this is going to be our population mean. Our population mean does not change. So it's still going to be mu, but what we divide by is going to be the standard deviation with respect to the sample mean. All right, so we need a little bit of like, how do we get there? So let me go down here. We can do the standard deviation with respect to our sample is equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So let's put that over here. So now we've got z-score is equal to x bar minus mu divided by the square, uh, sigma divided by the square root of n. Let me get the better square root there. So this is how we would go through and determine our new distribution. Now we can talk about, okay, what's the likelihood of having a sample of 10 being so far away from the mean? And this is how we're going to handle it. And I'll show you how we can do it in, um, in either Excel or in R Commander in the software videos.